Thanks for pressing play. You're listening to Christopher Lockhead, Follow Your Different. This is the podcast where we aspire to have authentic dialogues, not over-edited um, interviews, that celebrate the people, ideas, and companies that stand out. We're sponsored by the good folks at Oracle NetSuite. Learn how to turbocharge the growth of your business today at netsuite.com slash different. Now on this episode, the awesome Professor Mintzberg unpacks some powerful, uh, provocative, and counterintuitive approaches to managing and decision making. As well, he tells us why he thinks we need less of what he calls lofty leadership and more of what he thinks of as engaging management. Go to Lockhead.com to check out the show notes for this episode and key takeaways and learn more about Professor Mintzberg's incredible background and his new book. Without any further ado, hey-ho, let's go. Well, thank you for joining me, Professor. It's a pleasure, Chris. And I must tell you, um, people send me a lot of books and a lot of PR people pitch me a lot of authors. And uh, I was really knocked over by how simple and powerful this new book you've written is. Well, thank you. I won't argue. <laughs> and I do, of course, want to get to it. And as you can see, I've made lots of notes and so forth um, in, in, in your new book. But I wanted to just touch on a couple things before we go there, if we could, because um, there was a few other things that I was really found remarkable. Um, the first one is, you're the recipient of the Order of Canada, and so, um, if I'm not mistaken, that's the highest civilian uh, award the uh, government of Canada gives. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's interesting because it, this is not a country with a lot of chauvinism, but that pin that people wear, normally I have it on a jacket, is revered, absolutely revered. Uh, everybody knows it and everybody who has it wears it all the time, at least when they're dressed, dressed up a bit. Yeah, and so I must ask you, what does it feel like to to be the recipient of this extraordinary award? <laughs> it feels wonderful. I mean, you know, and especially because I got it uh, the same day that Rocket Richard and Jean Beliveau wow. <laughs> got it. So uh, my daughter has this picture. She's five one. Between these two, I mean, R- Richard wasn't big, Beliveau was big, but standing between these two big, famous hockey players. How fun. <laughs> that was the highlight. <laughs> so not only did you win the award, you got to hang out with living hockey legends. Yeah, actually, Mahovlich was the other guy, not Beliveau. Mahovlich is a big guy, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, I must say congratulations. It's an extraordinary uh, acknowledgement of your uh, work and contributions. Thank you. Okay. The other one I was knocked over by is uh, you have 20 honorary degrees. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I, I, never, I never sort of went around collecting them, I, just over many years. Uh, you know, uh, usually it was somewhere I wanted to go or some place to visit and, and, or some connection to a university that I've had relationships with, which is really lovely because it, it has a very good feeling. Plus, you know, one of the universities in Montreal, Concordia, and different places. It's, yeah. it's really nice. Yeah. And so, uh, to me, and of course, we're just meeting, but it really says something about the kind of educator you must be. I guess. I guess. I won't comment on it. I'll, I'll let those degrees speak for themselves, I yeah. guess. But, well, they sure but, do. Yeah. Why is it that you enjoy uh, being a professor, being a teacher, well, you know, I think I came into facility and teaching kind of late. I mean, late, you know, quite late in my career in the sense of I'd probably been a professor for 30 years or so when, um, when uh, I started to develop new programs. We have the International Masters in Practicing Management, IMPM.org, which is a very unusual kind of different program. And I think my real skills were in sort of helping with colleagues all over the world, actually, to design different different ways of approaching things um but i think those degrees have more to do with my publications than my teaching um because well my books it's my 20th book this one and they've been used all over the world uh probably more outside of north america even than inside um so been used a lot 
That's fascinating. Well, what an extraordinary career and set of contributions you've made. Uh, and it's, it really is a thrill to get to spend some time with you. Thank you. Now, you know, when I got this book, I, uh, of course, it's called Bedtime Stories for Managers. And manager is not a word you hear that often um, today. And um, I took the liberty of uh, reading um, m- most of most of the time I was reading your book. I decided to do that in bed. <laughs> right, that's the place. <laughs> because I felt that that would be appropriate. And uh, as a reader, I- I'm dyslexic. And years ago, and when I grew was growing up, you know, I can remember going to libraries and things like that, and books were this sort of um, pristine thing that you took care of. Mm-hmm. And a little bit later in life, in my early 20s, I learned that it was okay to make notes and underline and, you know, use stickies and, and so forth. And that, that mm-hmm. really helps me read. And so I had a stack of post-it notes next to my bed uh, as I was reading your book. And as you can see, um, th- there's just many of them in here. And so there's many incredible insights. But the first thing I wanted to start with is, why did you use this word managers? Why was that an important distinction for you? Well, that's a kind of hobby horse for me. That, that's a big issue. And one of the stories is about the fact that we can't separate leadership from management. And, um, and, and I think good leaders manage and good managers lead. You don't, nobody, wants, nobody wants a leader who doesn't manage. They don't know what's going on any more than they want a manager who doesn't lead because there's no inspiration. Um, and so the phrase I like is grounded management or, or engaging management uh, that, that, that managers are, or, or uh, uh, the word leader has been used too much for, for, for my blood. Um, and, and leadership always means an individual. When you refer to a leader, you're always referring to an individual. But as you know, looking at the book, I'm about community ship more than leadership. And managers enhance community ship. Of course, leaders do too. Managers are leaders. Leaders are managers. They, together, people who practice both together enhance community ship. Um, but 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 grounded leadership might sound a bit funnier than grounded management. So and, you know we can get into it later. But the first story is about kind of you know eating the products that you have your customers eat and living your customers' experience. To me, yeah. that's more like managing. Yeah. I, it, to me, it 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 you did a wonderful job with the title and then of course with the book itself. In, in grounding it in very real things. It's the opposite of, to your point, a lot of the highfalutin leadership stuff we hear today. Yeah. You know, everybody's a leadership expert today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's kind of, yeah, I, uh, I prefer, I, 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 we hear the word too much. I think leadership's important. I think Nelson Mandela was a very important man, but, uh, but we just hear the word too much these days. Yeah. Now, the first place I'd like to jump into the book with you on is, um, is around this concept of net, uh, a network. And just by, by way of a little bit of background, um, over the last couple of years, I've had some real interesting learnings in this regard. We've had uh, four-star General Stanley McChrystal on the podcast twice, and we've had mm-hmm. um, legendary uh, Silicon Valley venture capitalist Mike Maples on multiple times. Yeah. And both of them, in different ways, shared how... So, McChrystal, by way of example, he he ultimately ended up going to the president and saying, the way we're fighting this war is wrong, and what we have to do is not have this traditional command and control situation, but we actually have to create a network, because we're fighting a network enemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, there, he he sort of reimagined the Allied forces around this concept of there are these nodes inside a network and they mm-hmm. have a, a high level of autonomy, um, but with clear marching orders. Um, and, the, and, and, and he re-envisioned or reimagined uh, the, the allied forces as a network. And then mm-hmm. in the case of Mike Maples, he makes the argument that the corporation, as we understand it today, uh, really came to be 
uh, as a result of the Industrial Revolution. And he believes the traditional command and control hierarchical uh, corporation is a dying thing and that the new model of business is, again, a network model. And mm -hmm. what you have to do as, a, as, as, a, as a, a business executive is harness the power of a network. And sometimes those are people who work inside your company and sometimes they're not, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so with that said as background, I'm very curious. I, I would love you to educate me a little bit on um, your perspective on why network is so important. Yeah, that's interesting. And let me say something about the General McChrystal. I, I had a call from somebody in his office, worked very closely with him in the consulting firm, not when he was in the Army. And, um, and um, there's a very, there seems to be a real kind of connection between what he's doing. This person kind of loved my work and thought, I think McChrystal himself, uh, like that work, and um, and so there was an interesting connection there. Um, Have you been able to talk to him, Professor? No, I, 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 I chatted with somebody in his office. I think we were trying to set up a, a meeting or a visit uh, that didn't happen, at least not yet. Um, but, uh, but but was interesting so that he came up that way. Um, I, in my next book, actually, which is a previous book that I'm revising, I talk about different forms of organizations, and, and I wouldn't say that the traditional bureaucratic organization, which I call a program machine, uh, is dead, or hierarchy is dead by any stretch. I mean, if you're manufacturing automobiles or, or doing some pretty routine kind of stuff, you know, uh, with thousands of clerks sitting in an office or a call center or something, I think you still need hierarchy. But there's a form of organization that I call it hocracy, but in the book I call it the, the project pioneers or project organization. Uh, and those are network organizations. That's what they're about. Um, and, uh, and I think that's many of the contemporary organizations with very high-tech uh, uh, employees and doing very fancy kinds of stuff like uh, Google or, or whatever, um, very much are network organizations, and the network relationship is absolutely critical. Um, but I do make a distinction between communities and networks, um, because I think they're both important. And, and what, I, what I believe is that, um, is that if you want to find out the difference between a network and a community, ask your Facebook friends to help paint your house or rebuild your barn. As to use the old American uh, kind of metaphor story, and um, and you find out the difference between communities and network. Communities are tighter and more personal. Uh, networks are more relationship. One is one is for communication, and the other is for collaboration. Networks are much more about communication. I think communities, which go beyond networks to closer relationships, are about collaboration. Um, so I think uh, I agree that. Uh, the networks are absolutely critical, but I also want to emphasize communities as being, uh, you know, what I say over and over is an effective organization is a, is a community of human beings, not a net, not a, uh, not a, not a, uh, um, uh, a network of human resources. Actually, I don't say network. I can't remember what I say, but, <laughs> but, um, but, but, but community of, of, of human beings, not a collection. That's what I say, not a collection of human right. resources. And by definition, then, a community would tend to be smaller than a network? Yeah, I mean, networks can be massive. Uh, communities tend to be small. Yeah, they tend to be smaller. Now, now The number of people uh, who would communicate with me is, is large, but the number of people who would help me paint my house is much smaller. <laughs> yeah, you don't want a thousand people to help you paint your house. Um, uh, but, but what you do want is, is, in this day and age, is communities networking. So you, what you can have is each small community networks with lots of other small communities to make things happen. In business, these are, you know, companies that tend to have small factories, for example, but very effective, like Magna, part, auto parts producer in Canada, that typically, I don't know if they still do, but they typically had factories of about 100 people, and then they create another one instead. So you keep it small, but you network these communities across the whole organization. Yeah, and I think that was, you know, and I, I can't put words in his mouth, of course, but as I remember it, I think that was also the McChrystal idea, yeah. the smaller yeah. groups that are connected in that regard. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it's just, a, it's just a fascinating set of thinking. Um, mm -hmm. Now, maybe we could go to, you use this phrase, epidemic 
of managing without soul. Yeah, right. Yeah, so could you bring that to life a little bit for me, Professor? Well, it, you know, it, it, there, there's, I, people get in touch with me, or I chat with people. I mean, I'm an organization guy, so I'm always finding out about organizations. I'm, I'm also sort of, I also feel I can walk into an organization and in about two minutes I can tell if the place is together or not. You know, you get a feeling when you walk in. You know, Walmart might have greeters, um, but I walked into a Walmart store in Montreal on a Wednesday afternoon, quiet day, and the merchandise was strewn everywhere. The lights were out in the sign. It didn't take long for me to say there's something wrong with this place, which was confirmed later by somebody who, who worked for a company that sells to them. Um, so so I, I, I kind of you know can get that feeling as soon as I walk into an organization. And, and some just click and they work well and too many are part of this epidemic of managing without soul there's no feeling in the place you know you walk into a, a certain hotel or you walk into a certain restaurant and sometimes it's like wow this place is wonderful and other times like what's going on here what's wrong with this place you know and and usually it's a management that's disconnected or overbearing or whatever and that's what i mean by managing without soul yeah it's the experience I have every time I walk into, we have a pharmacy chain here that you might be familiar with called CVS. Yeah. And when you walk into a CVS, uh, your, um, your desire to live is, is, is diminished a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. And so. this is a topic that, um, you know, when I started this podcast, I didn't know that this would be a theme that would come up many, many times in talking to uh, entrepreneurs and CEOs and venture capitalists and people creating mm -hmm. amazing businesses. It mm -hmm. just seems to be something that is on a lot of people's minds. And so if I was a CEO or maybe not even a CEO, to your point, if I was a manager and I wanted to infuse some more soul into my organization, um, what would you guide me to do? Um, get out of your office, find out what's going on. Don't be worried about being accused of micromanaging because there's a difference between finding out what's going on and being in touch and micromanaging. They're not the same thing, but, but people are, um, you know, it brings me to the first story. Uh, I don't know, should I mention at this point about the opening story is called Managing Scrambled Eggs. And it's about the biggest airline in the world at the time that went bankrupt soon after and I took a flight from Montreal to New York. In those days, they served breakfast, and they served these things they called scrambled eggs. And I said to the flight attendant, like this, I've never eaten anything this bad. And she said, I know we keep telling them they won't listen. Now, if you're running a, a cemetery and you don't talk to your customers, I understand. But if you're running, <laughs> <laughs> but if, if you're running a, uh, an airline, and then somebody came up to me when I told that story later he was from ibm and he said uh, he said well let me tell you a story he said the chief executive came late for a plane they bumped the first class passenger so that he could sit in uh, first class and put the passenger in the back well the passenger turned out to be the president of ibm and um and so i conclude the story by saying it's not about status uh, that managing is not about sitting where you become accustomed or sitting in first class. Managing is about eating scrambled eggs. That's what managing is. Managing is eating scrambled eggs. So if you want to get past this, uh, this syndrome of, uh, of, uh, of, you know, this uh, managing without soul, eat the scrambled eggs. Live your customer's experience. Visit your factory. Talk to your workers. Be involved. Connect. Yeah, I, I often, you know, when you call... But I'll just pick on one by way of example. You call AT and T customer service, and, and and you just think, or Comcast is probably even worse. Mm -hmm. And you just think, has the CEO of Comcast ever called Comcast? Because calling Comcast makes you want to throttle somebody, you know. And, yeah. and and you just think, how is it? How is this even possible in 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 2019 that a, a company like that could could treat customers so horribly? You know, and they have mechanisms for saying we're sorry, but this 
this call will take 32 minutes. And if you want, leave your number and we'll, we'll call you back. You know, they have those mechanisms for doing that. But, you know, when a company says on a phone, we appreciate your business, the translation of that is our time is more important than your time. That's the way I read it. Yes. And, you know, down here we have, of course, um, Southwest Airlines. And mm-hmm. um, you look at, I look at American Airlines or United Airlines and Southwest Airlines. And my personal point of view is um, two of those companies uh, are, are run by assholes with spreadsheets. And one of those <laughs> companies is, is run by people with a true north. And the first experience you have just tells you that because when you call Southwest, they answer the phone. Yeah, yeah, I know. They care. They care. It's not so hard. And, and uh, you know, my favorite story about airlines and how they completely miss it is British is, uh, you know, you're using Southwest as an example, the discount airline. So in Europe, you've got Ryanair and so on, you know, that run perfectly well. Or, I mean, they've got their problems, but, but they're... they're kind of responsive in their own way. When British Midland created uh, a discount airline, they called it Baby. Okay, now, I don't think this story's in the book, but think of, think of calling an airline Baby. You're the, you're the vice president Baby, and you're sitting in an executive committee with the vice president maintenance and the vice president passenger sales, and you're the vice president Baby. Uh, who's going to listen to you? And, and do you really think people want to fly on an airline? called baby what they were announcing to the entire world is this is not serious Uh, inadvertent they didn't even think about it they just thought well it's a cutesy title um but that's the kind of mentality that you have in some of the traditional companies that have to adapt so they say okay we'll do a discount airline and then they do it stupidly yeah now there are some provocative uh I don't know if you'd call them positions or ideas, you'll tell me, but there's, there's some provocative thinking in this book that's counterintuitive. Mm-hmm. Uh, in no particular order, one of them you say is decision-making is not what you think. Mm-hmm. And you take what I would consider a, a fairly counterintuitive uh, perspective on decision making. Could could you unpack that a little bit for me as well, Professor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you're married or have a spouse or a partner, but but I you sure probably. Do. I'm, a, I'm very married. <laughs> okay, well, you probably didn't ar- arrive at that by doing a traditional form of decision making. You know, list all the women that are possible and find out all the characteristics of these women and rate them on all these things, add it all up, and then form the lucky woman. I mean, that's how we're told to make decisions, right? Spreadsheets, for- RFPs, <laughs> et cetera. The whole Megillah, exactly. Megillah is my university, but the whole Megillah, exactly. And, um, and, and, you know, people, you know, Indian marriages sometimes are arranged like that. But usually, you know, you, you, that's, I call that thinking first. Uh, it, it happens for lots of things, but lots of others doesn't work. Uh, seeing first is called love at first sight. You turn the corner and there she is and that's it. End of decision. Um, sometimes with my father, uh, who called my grandmother the day he met my mother and said I met the woman I'm going to marry, worked out perfectly well. So that I call seeing first, and that's how a lot of decisions are made. You meet a new, you're, you're hiring for a new position, you meet all the different people, and somebody walks in and you say, bang, that's it, that's the perfect person in two seconds. That's seeing first. And doing first, I'll leave it to everybody's imagination what that means about a spouse, but essentially, you don't quite know what to do, so you try something, see if it works. If it doesn't work, you try something else, and you keep trying till it works, except uh, uh, I have a colleague who once said about this kind of decision making, he said there are certain things like having a baby or starting a nuclear war where it's best not to say, let's try a little one and see how it works. <laughs> and so. so I thought it was a very brilliant insight because we live in a business world uh, and I would imagine it's probably fairly similar with nonprofits and various different types of organizations where you know, there's huge purchasing departments and there's processes that are put in place and RFPs and spreadsheet ROI analysis and mm-hmm. discounted cash flows into the future and you know, make a decision to buy it. One company's going to buy another company and there's all this analysis and, and so forth and so on, hiring to your point. And yet 
what you're saying to us is the reality is you may do all those things, you may come up with those justifications, but for the most part, that's not how we make decisions. Given that well, reality, yeah, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, I just wanted to ask you, given that reality, that aha, that we make decisions much more like the spouse decision and much less like the spreadsheet decision, um, how do I, as a manager, as a business person, sort of ag- acknowledge that reality and and try to take that forward so that I make, quote unquote, good decisions? You, you know, you've got to take all the people who are enamored with that off your back somehow. Uh, one way to take those people off your back is never go near an ILO and <laughs> stay off the stock market so you don't have a bunch of analysts forcing you to do all this and to report every quarter, which is insane, and to, uh, and to uh, you know, cater to the stock analysts who want to manage your company better than you do. Um, but look, you need analysis to check out intuition, and you need intuition to check out analysis. And um, you know what I mean? You can't, you can't just do these kind of intuitive things um, and, and let it be. If there's data, check it out. But if you're doing analysis, use intuition to check it out. But I want to give a big, big qualification. I have a very particular definition of intuition. Intuition is when you know for sure, you just don't know why. A hunch is not intuition. And people are running around saying, I'm intuiting about this and that. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could you say that first sentence again for me? Yeah. About intuition? Which one? The very beginning about, about intuition. About definition of intuition? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I define intuition as when you know for sure, you just don't know why. You don't know why it's true and you don't know why you know, but you feel in your gut that it's true. Uh, So people who have a hunch, that's not an intuition. Uh, People who are biased don't have good intuition because the bias gets in your way of your intuition. Intuition is when you just have a feeling that just something is right or something is wrong and you've got to change it. Um, and, so, and so it's very restricted in a way. It's only, it only works when you have those feelings. But if you've got all those pressures from stock market analysts and planners in your own company and everything, uh, it's very hard to be intuitive uh, when you're always being second-guessed. Uh, that's why int- entrepreneurs can be intuitive uh, and tend to be anyway, a lot easier than other people because they own the place. And if they say, it, if Steve Jobs said he didn't like that design, that was it, boy. Although people were prepared to challenge him and he was prepared to listen. So he could find the things uh, that worked. Um, but he was the boss. So if he wanted to be intuitive, he could be intuitive. Whether his other people could be intuitive, probably they could because Jobs would listen to them, the ones he respected. So, so no, knowing that, if I said to you, well, Professor, you know, that makes a lot of sense to me. That's been my experience in my life and in my business career. Now I want to get better at having good intuition, the best intuition I can have. Is intuition something we can develop? Mm, I doubt it. I mean, what you can de- develop is experience. You can add to your experience. The more experience you have, the better your intuition is going to be. I believe me, I have no intuition about how I should walk on the moon, okay? Because I never got the chance and never will get the chance. But I can be intuitive about organizations where I walk in, as I said earlier, where where I walk into an organization and just say, this place is really hopping or, boy, there's something wrong here. I can be intuitive about that because I have an awful lot of experience. You have to be careful about experience because, you know, you might have the wrong kind of experience. You might be applying it in the wrong place. Um, But what you can do, I don't think you can become more intuitive. You can become more experienced so that your intuition, so that your intuition works better. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes a ton of sense. Um, Now uh, there's just so much awesomeness in this book. Um, I wanted to ask you, 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 make this, you make this distinction between lofty leadership. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm at a friend's house, and, uh, okay, we forgot to take the phone off. The hook. I just looked it up and put it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you pissed off a friend, or maybe you just got rid of a telemarketer. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, who knows? 
So you make this dis- this distinction between what you call lofty leadership and engaged management, and yeah. you say that managers are important to the extent that they help other people be important. Yeah. And yet a lot of senior management doesn't, in my experience, behave this way. Uh, could you kind of unpack this a little bit for me as well? Yeah, I mean, we've got, you know, we've got an awful lot of narcissism in the name of, of leadership. Um, and I don't question the narcissism of some entrepreneur who really gets it and really does good things. I don't include uh, anybody. I won't, I won't get into politics. But, <laughs> but uh, I don't, um, I don't um, um, uh, question that. What I do question are people who inherit a company in the sense that, you know, it's long established, it's working really well, they waltz in, the board likes them, they appoint them, and they think they're somehow responsible for the whole success of the company. And, and we've got so much of that going on. And often these people are very disconnected. You know, they're very detached. Um, I, I heard a horror story in England about this guy who was running a big company and uh, nobody could walk in front of his office. If, if you wanted to pass his office, you had to go down the stairs, pass the office and come up the stairs. Um, and then um, if you did make it into his office, his chair was set up so he was higher than you. He was probably a small guy. And his chair overlooked you, okay? Uh, this guy was so bad that the British government put him into an even more senior job in a bigger organization, state organization. So here you have this kind of utter imbecile uh, impressing outsiders. You know what they said, uh, this expression about kiss up and kick down. Uh, he was probably marvelous at kissing up and he was completely kicking down. He never should have gone anywhere. But, you know, the way to deal with that is to give people who have been managed by the candidates for jobs a chance to pass judgment on them. That, you know, if you, if you want to find out about somebody's ability to manage, um, there are only two ways. Or, or if, you, if you want to find out about somebody's flaws, because when you're hiring a manager, you better know about their flaws. And there's only two ways to know a person's flaws, I think. One is to marry them and the other is to work for them. Now, you can't ask spouses about, or ex-spouses about somebody's flaws, but you can ask people who work for them about their flaws, and we should be doing a lot more. We can improve the practice of management monumentally by hearing the voices of people who work for the candidates for jobs. That's, that's very interesting because often, of course, uh, when we check references or we do blind references, we, we talk to superiors, people who this person worked for, but uh, I mean, Big you mistake. tell me, it's not my experience anyway that um, where recruiters talk to people who worked for this individual. They work, they talk to the people that this individual worked for. So yeah, that's a fascinating Big insight. Big mistake. Big mistake. Look, there's one company in this world, probably more than one in particular I think of, who, are, who have been the leader in their industry for decades, okay? They, you know the company, everybody listening knows the company, they're, they're fantastically famous company, um, and they pick their chief executive through a closed vote of their senior management, okay? The, the chief executive is, up the, uh, is actually elected through a closed vote of the senior management. The company is McKinsey and Company, uh, and the senior partners elect the chief executive to a three-year term. Now, I doubt if McKinsey ever recommended that to any of its clients, um, but maybe it should be. So I, I'm not you really know, it's, lobbying it's, for electing chief executives, but, but getting the voice of, of people who know the people through having been managed by them is critical. It's interesting you bring up McKinsey. I had the wonderful opportunity to work for a handful of years uh, with Fred Gluck, who Mm -hmm. was the former uh, chief executive of McKinsey. He was on our board. I was uh, the head of marketing for a company called Scient in the 90s, and he was on our board. And he carried himself um, in a – you've now explained to me why he carried himself, at least in part, the way he did. I, I didn't know how much of it was the culture and how much of it was him, but he did not carry himself as though he was better than others. 
Yeah, yeah. He was in, yeah. he was a very curious man. He was a uh, wanted to know what you thought, wanted to engage in dialogue, wanted to be the last person to uh, raise his point of view. Um, mm-hmm. He was not a uh, sort of pound the table and this is what you're going to do and you're an idiot kind of a guy. Yeah. He was the yeah. incredibly collaborative. So, and I didn't realize that's how they did it. So you've you've explained something to me about. Uh, his behavior that's interesting. The other question in this regard I have, do you think things like, um, are, are you familiar at all, Professor, with Glassdoor? Um, uh, how are you using it? I know about glass ceilings. Yeah, so there's this website called Glassdoor, and it's sort of like a Yelp for business. It's a place where you can go anonymously as an employee mm-hmm. and talk about your experience working at the company. Do you like it? Don't you mm-hmm. like it? Why? Et cetera. And mm-hmm. you can talk specifically about the senior management team, the CEO, and so forth. And so I mm-hmm. just wonder, as employees are now able to go to an internet website, and sort of uh, report on their experience of being an employee in an anonymous way, I wonder if that will begin to change um, behavior in this regard, because now, you know, the wonderful thing about the internet is we have a voice that, um, as individuals, that in many cases we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Sounds good. Sounds like the right kind of thing. It's like assessing your doctor anonymously. Um, and people can check how this physician was, uh, was the, you know, people responded to this physician. So those are good things. That's good stuff that comes on the web, as long as the Russians don't get a hold of it, right? Yeah, we always <laughs> got to be mindful of Putin. <laughs> 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 now, th- you have some wonderful turns of phrases in here and sort of headline points that you make. Uh, one that jumped out by, by way of example to me is choosing the devil you had better get to know. Yeah. <laughs> so could you tell me about how I choose the devil that I had better get to know? <laughs> well, I think uh, that's that's all part of all part of recruiting. The, the people have flaws and um, and uh, you're you're selecting people not only for their strengths. Of course, you want to select people for their strengths, but you better select them for their flaws. Uh, I made a list, and, and it's in the book of of what taking all the lists I could find of what an effective manager is. There's 52 points on the list, and and what I say is, you know, if you want to be an effective manager, you better be all 52 of these things. Uh, the trouble is, you won't be human. Um, and if, uh, if kryptonite was on the list, even Superman would fail, you know? So, so you've got to be uh, careful about, uh, about people's flaws. You have to pick people for their flaws as much as for their strengths, because what's going to bring them down is, is their flaws. So everybody's got flaws, but you can pick people whose flaws don't appear to be fatal under the circumstances, you know? So, uh, so um, choose the devil, you know, and, um, and find out about the and devil. The devil, you should get to know it. Uh, it's such a fascinating, uh, counterintuitive thing to say. Select people for their flaws. Mm. Uh, as I read this sort of theme in, in your new book, one of the things that uh, I was reminded of, I'm somebody who has very meaningful flaws and deficiencies, and if you worked mm-hmm. with me, they would become very apparent to you very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, I have so far dyslexia. so good. Pardon me. <laughs> so far so good. So far so good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, and so, uh, the, the, what I tried to do as a, hopefully a manager and a leader was to be self-aware. So I've I've always thought that being self-aware and and is the is the way to get to self-actualization. And mm-hmm. the way to build a team, if you're a manager or a leader, certainly when I was a, a, the head of marketing for companies, I tried to build teams that compensated for my massive flaws. So while there were mm-hmm. people I had some overlapping skills with, of course, um, yeah. the vast majority of my direct reports were people who were super strong in areas where I was virtually blind. Yeah. And, and so... Um, how would you advise people do that? One, one, I like this idea of try to interview 
uh, people who worked for this individual. That's a very powerful insight. Uh, are there other ideas you'd have, uh, you'd point me to, to, to get to know somebody's flaws? Well, you know, we, we uh, I mentioned our program before International Masters uh, uh, for, for Managers, and, and um, uh, reflection is a big thing in that program. In fact, we run a module in Japan where they deal with Zen, and we run a module in India where they go to ashrams. Um, and, and so there's all kinds of ways to reflect, but some way to step back. You know, managing is hectic. That's one of the points in the book. It's, it's frenetic. It, 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 it's, it's, and especially with internet and email, a lot of managers get driven over the edge. They just go, they lose it because they're under such pressure. You've got to be able to step back. Reflection is a way to step back. Coming to the program like the one I mentioned is a step, is a way to step back. Uh, doing Zen or doing, you know, I go out in a canoe. Uh, every chance, we have a house on a lake, and every chance I get, I'm on that lake. In a, Where's in a, your house, uh, Professor? It's near Montreal, in the Laurentian Mountains, north of Montreal. I, I grew up a, skiing on um, Mont Saint-Sauveur. Yeah, yeah, so we're about a 15-minute drive from there. And, Beautiful country. Um, yeah, and we're on a little lake that has no motorboats, and... Uh, and we're, uh, I collect beaver sculptures on my website, minstrug.org slash beaver. You can see my beaver sculptures. And um, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm together with my partner. We're on that lake every day we can. Uh, not now. The ice is about uh, two feet thick. Uh, although one time, one time the kids dragged Makes the canoe over. paddle, doesn't it, Professor? Yes, tough. <laughs> but, uh, a few years ago, the kids decided to do a photo op. They grabbed the dragged out the canoe we put on fur hats and took pictures of the canoe sitting in the snow um but usually we don't get the canoe on the lake uh, this time of year um but it's wonderful it's absolutely wonderful way of uh, you know I, I was thinking uh, uh, you know i don't meditate and then i realized i, I meditate in the canoe that's where i or s- snowshoeing or bicycling or hiking or that's the way i meditate yeah, it's interesting that you say that. Um, uh, for the last little while, I have almost every day, not not every day, but almost every day, I go for a walk. We yeah. live two blocks yeah. from the ocean. Yeah. Uh, I said to my oh. wife, Carrie, I said, you know, it's crazy that, you know, I'm a surfer, so I'm in the ocean on a regular basis. But if I don't surf that uh, on a particular day, I might not see the ocean. And it, I had this aha, which is, it is absolutely insane that we live two blocks from the Pacific Ocean and we don't see the ocean every day. It's a, it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a very short walk, obviously. And so, um, I've done two things. One, I I diligently work at getting to uh, doing a walk to the ocean every day. And more recently, mm-hmm. uh, I made the decision to delete um, all of the social media apps off of my phone. So I uh-huh. them on my computer. And I can check my Twitter and Facebook and and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I took them off my phone because I just found it was so distracting. And so it may sound overly simplistic, but by not allowing myself to be as distracted as I used to, and by, and I'll use the word sort of force in air quotes, to go for a walk and look at the ocean every day, um, Mm -hmm. that's a meditation as well. Absolutely, absolutely, and and looking at uh, looking at Twitter is the opposite. Although for me, yes. Twitter is I don't like the others, but for me, Twitter is key for my blog. My blog is uh, I I call my blog a twog, a tweet to blog, um, because uh, I, I use Twitter just to tell people what's on my blog, yeah. so I can get them to go from a sentence or as I put it, a pithy sentence or two to a pithy uh, page or two. And has that been effective for you? That's where the book came from. The book is all from my blogs. Yeah. And I have a ball with the blog. I love doing the blogs, twogs. <laughs> That's interesting. Now, we just talked about beavers. Um, in the book, you also talk about cows. <laughs> so could you tell yeah. me about this uh, organized like a cow? <laughs> <laughs> this is a this is an ad from a software company. I'm not I'm not supposed to mention because they said you could use the story, um, you, you know. But uh, but uh, don't say who it is because our promotion and marketing now is different. I kind of have trouble understanding that. But anyway, um, so I 
picked up on it and I used a different, I, I, I used different wording and different um, photograph, but, um, but it's, but it's two stories about cows. Um, so one is, is working like a cow and um, cows are really good at coordinating their different parts. I mean, cows are terrific hearts, lungs, bowels, brains, it all works beautifully, harmoniously. Cows are really good at that. And so are we as individuals, but we're not very good at it socially. We're not very good at working that harmoniously in our organizations or our clubs or whatever. And so it's all about working like a cow. All we have to do is work like a cow. Um, and then uh, in, our, in our IMPM program, I mentioned before, uh, we were on a module in India, and, and we take people, you know, they take a tour of Bangalore to see the city and see the place, and so on. And one year, and they were all waiting to cross MG Road, Mahatma Gandhi Road, which is uh, uh, very chaotic, quite wide, and, and very chaotic with everything going by. Uh, and the whole class looked like, how in the world are we going to get across this street? And the guy who was leading them said, it's very easy. You walk like a cow, okay? And what he meant was we cluster together, we, don't, we go slow, we, don't, we walk right into the traffic, we go slow, they're used to seeing cows, and all the traffic will go around us. And so they quietly walked like a cow and crossed the street. And this became a popular metaphor too. So this is how to work like a cow. You walk like a cow in order to work like a cow. There you go. And is part of what you're trying to teach us as well, uh, you know, because cows are, of course, not known for their speed. They're not exactly cheetahs. Right. Is part of what you're trying to communicate as well to maybe slow down a little? You mentioned earlier how hectic it is and, of course, yeah. technology and all that stuff. It just, we're so distracted and, and so yeah. forth and so on. And so is part of the communication for us to slow down a little bit like a cow? Yeah, I mean, I don't make that connection, but that's a very appropriate connection. Sure, you just cross slowly and gradually and determine You're determined. You know, you don't do any false moves because if you break away from that group, and do some small, some, some move, some bicycle or truck or bus is going to hit you. So, so, but they're not going to hit the whole crowd. So, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's a very appropriate. Interesting. Now, Professor, I, I think I could probably talk to you for 12 hours straight, uh, but I want to be super respectful of your time. Are there, is there okay. anything else that you would like to touch on before we wrap? Uh, no, I think we covered a lot. Uh, there's a lot more in the book, and um, uh, I love writing that book. I had such a good time doing that book. And, uh, you know, it was the publisher, it was Katie uh, at the uh, publisher who came up with the title, which uh, the original title was Managing Scrambled Eggs. And Katie said, how about bedtime stories for managers? And I thought that was absolutely terrific. So I don't take credit for the title. I take credit for a lot more in the book, but... Um, Terrific, absolutely terrific. And Barrett Cole is just a wonderful publisher to deal with. Hmm. Well, you really have written a wonderful book. Uh, it's modern, but it's got um, a wonderful sort of uh, simplicity to it. It's incredibly easy to consume. I love the way it's written because you could just you could read one story and then fall asleep. Uh, and so it is the kind of book, and this is how I consumed it, because I thought maybe this is what you were trying to tell me to do. I consumed it. It sat on the side of my bed, and I would go to bed, and I would read a part of it and fall asleep, and then, you know, have at it the next night, and, and, and like that. And which is sort of an unusual thing, maybe, uh, for a business book. Um, but your book is so easy to consume, and um, it, it's, it's in, it, as an author myself, I know how hard it is to make something so simple, uh, colloquial, um, consumable, but yet so counterintuitive and profound at the same time. Yeah. You know, when we had the launch a couple of days ago, we, uh, we opened the, my comments, I showed different pages of the book, and we opened it with Annie Lennox singing, Sweet Dreams Are Made of This. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is perfect. So my hope, by the way, I inscribe the book to people, I hope that your sweet dreams will be made of this. <laughs> so, and I hope anybody who listens and gets the book will have sweet dreams that are made of this. <laughs> so thank you, Chris. That's terrific. Yeah. Great thank, interview. I loved it. Thank you so much, Professor. Professor, uh, it's really been a joy to get to know you and to talk about this wonderful book.
Yeah, good. Whew. Professor Henry Mintzberg on the podcast. Man, uh, that was a great one. I sure hope you loved it. And uh, I want to ask you, are you still struggling with QuickBooks? Maybe it's time to um, put on your big girl pants or your big boy pants and uh, upgrade to the leader in cloud ERP, my friends, at NetSuite. Why struggle with aging business systems, fragmented reporting, and never-ending IT costs? When you switch from QuickBooks to NetSuite, you get one integrated cloud solution that allows you to lower your costs, streamline key business processes, and boost productivity across the board. With NetSuite, you can manage your entire business end-to-end -end in one integrated cloud suite. And you're not going to have to juggle any more separate software applications or waste time uh, maintaining a hairball of on-premise software uh, crapola. <laughs> NetSuite is the number one company in cloud ERP. They're the category king. As a matter of fact, they're started by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurial businesses. And um, that's why I'm so proud to have them associated with this podcast. Now, as a uh, regular listener to this um, podcast, you can go to netsuite.com slash different. And NetSuite is offering you a free growth review with somebody in your industry, a growth expert in your industry. So why not take them up on your offer? You've probably heard me um, do this, uh, do this um, call out for them before. And if you've been sitting on the fence, why not go to netsuite.com slash different right now. Uh, speaking of places you can go on the internet, if you want, you can check us out. Our website is lockhead.com. And uh, even if you subscribe on one of the major podcast applications, we don't know you exist until you go to Lockhead.com and subscribe. We've been uh, working hard lately to take our newsletter game up and uh, not just update you on episodes, but try to provide you with provocative and engaging, inspiring content from the podcast and, um, you know, maybe some tidbits here and there um, that I think you'll enjoy. So you you tell me, go to lockhead.com, subscribe, and let us know how we're doing with the newsletter. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at, at Lockhead. All right. We would like to thank this incredible new book by Professor Henry Mintzberg, Bedtime Stories for Managers. Check it out wherever you pick up legendary books. Uh, shout out to a podcast that I love, the Mission Daily Podcast. This is a podcast for smart people who want to get smart, smarter. Check it out. The Amazon number one bestseller, Niche Down, How to Become Legendary by Being Different, from Heather Clancy and myself. One of my favorite nonprofits, the good people at OneLifeFullyLived.org, where we help you dream, plan, and live your best life. And if you're an entrepreneur committed to growth, why not check out GrowWire.com? It's a great new place on the internet with awesome content. Uh, there's a YouTube channel, podcast that I've been lucky enough to be on. So check out GrowWire.com. Now, um, maybe it's time you've thought about leveraging the power of a virtual assistant to get back that one resource that none of us can back, get back, which is time. Check out my friends at bottleneck.online today. And um, shout out to an amazing business called Fisher's Popcorn. Amazing caramel popcorn and a variety of other awesome flavors since 1937 in beautiful Ocean City, Maryland. And always at Fisher's popcorn.com and the incredible people at Habitat for Humanity. Habitat's vision is of a world where everyone has a decent place to live. Why not make a difference at habitat.org today? All right, I need to remind you that this oddcast is a sole property of the Lockhead Oddcast Network. All rights do remain perturbed. Uh, clearly, we need to warn you that this oddcast is produced in a studio that does contain nuts. Remember to teach management, support your local entrepreneurs, Fishing for a good time starts with throwing in your line. Don't forget to buy John's crazy socks. Don't be lame. Get out of the passing lane. Thank you, Candy Dandy. I love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go to Richard Kelly, chairman of Pacific Gas and Electric. Sorry, Dick. We just ran out of time for you. That's it, my friends. Stay legendary. And until we're together again, follow your different.